Ham Nation is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by Hover. Upgrade your domain to the perfect match. Millions of companies' names end with dot .inc. Now your domain name can too. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. This is Ham Nation, episode number 478, November 4th, 2020. A video tribute to Cliff Kehart, W4KKP, the oldest active ham, who is now a silent key. Good evening, everybody. This is Bob Heil, and you're tuned in to Ham Nation. It's a program about ham radio, and tonight is a very special very special show. The only way I can t- tell you is to preface it a little bit, uh, uh, and I'll do that in the beginning, but I want you to know who else here. Uh, George is not with us tonight, but uh, Gordo, you're here from Southern Cal. You doing okay? okay. Yep, we are uh, doing fine out here, and uh, four years uh, for me, U.S. Army, this will be quite a tribute tonight and we're one week away from veterans day as well yes very good that's great and don how are you doing and tell us what's in the background there uh doing as good as we can uh, as can be expected we lost power at eight o'clock last wednesday night as uh, uh hurricane zeta came through no major damage just some shingles and stuff and uh Coming to grips with uh, being unemployed now. Lost my job on Monday. That was uh, oh. unexpected oh, no. and real exciting. But, oh. uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll muddle through. Behind me, the flag you see, um, uh, speaking of World War II, my dad was a World War II veteran. He fought uh, in the Pacific Theater. Uh, wasn't on Iwo Jima, but nearby. Um, <laughs> the Philippines, New Guinea. And uh, that is the flag from his casket, and uh, that oh. goes along with our rather um, uh, our rather honorable subject matter tonight, Bob. So yeah. we'll have uh, news also from Amateur Radio Newsline. Uh, Dr. Scove is missing in action tonight, but uh, we'll catch up with her uh, on at another time. Okay. And Amanda, how are you? Everything is so calm and cool in, Cal- in Colorado and no fires around you, any of that? Nope, we have put out the fires pretty much, so we're we're doing good there. And um, I look forward to chatting with the chat room this evening and uh, really looking forward to this uh, one and only segment we're going to have this evening. And I think everyone else is really going to enjoy it too, and we'll have some comments at the end. Excellent. Well, I wanted to start giving you just a, a, just a real quick minute about how this happened. I, uh, I had read that there was a 106-year-old ham in QST, and um, a guy called me one day, W4DRH, and he he told me this story about uh, the man, and he was having trouble hearing his uh, 706. So I sent him a pair of our Pro 3 headsets, and the next thing you know, I ended up in South Carolina because we were coming down for the uh, uh, West Shum event. Remember I told you we had a couple of stories on that, the winter field day with Wes. And so uh, it was wonderful. Uh, Hugh said, well, you get down here and uh, I'll come pick you up. So he was my Uber driver. Well, I figured while we're there, maybe I could go visit the club. So we did. Uh, Hugh took me around and we got to go to the club. Now, that club had, at the time, they had a 103-year-old man there, ham, and they had 106 year I wanted to know what was in the water. <laughs> had a good time at the club. But then he took me over to my friend Wayne. 
Wayne is an amazing guy that I met uh, through Harvey Wells. He's the Harvey Wells guru. And uh, what you're looking at there is a Harvey Wells and a Harvey Wells linear with the 4400. It's the only one in the world. He built it. And then he wanted to build a receiver because Harvey Wells never built a receiver ever. Well, there's the only one in the world. He took a transmitter case and, oh, it's beautiful. So I had a great time uh, with uh, with he and his wife, he, just the crazy uh, antennas and all this stuff. The only guy I knew that had a loop on his pickup truck. And so then we got to spend the rest of the time with Cliff Kahart. And I, I, I took with me my video camera and a couple of microphones and what you're going to see tonight is a piece of history. Uh, Hugh told me going in, he said, I don't know if he'll tell you any of this. He usually doesn't talk about it. He got to talking about it. Oh, my, did he ever. So I'm, uh, I'm really proud, extremely honored and blessed to be able to bring you the history of this great ham. And only because he was a ham. Don't forget this. So many things happened in this world because of amateur radio operators. Here to me was one of the greatest W4KKP. Here is the story. I'm Bob Heil, K9EID. This is an interview with Cliff K. Hart, W4KKP. Cliff is the oldest living amateur radio operator, and he relates the story of his appointment to install the communication system on Iwo Jima. This is a fascinating story. Cliff, it's my honor to be with you. My and, honor to be with you, too. And uh, what was your birthday? What was the last birthday? How many? October 14th, I was one, one, uh, 106, and I'll be 107 this coming October. Wow. And you're still active on ham radio. Oh, yes. Yeah. Look at all the cars. We'll have to show some of these in a little bit. Well, I'm so honored to be here. And one of the things I want to ask you, if you would like to talk about it at all, is you did a thing with a special antenna during the war, right? Oh, yeah. That was a uh, rhombic antenna. It's very directional. Yeah. They, they are the triangular right. type things. Uh -huh. Had three of those. Mm -hmm. three towers, and uh, fortunately the sea bees put up the towers. <laughs> they were nice steel towers, and uh, they did that, and they also built me a nice Quonset hut all right. to put all the transmitters and so on. Yeah, yeah. So it was nice, and I had a crew of 12 altogether mm -hmm. that went with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, most of the work that the crew did they put in the, the poles. They were, in in uh, civilian life, they worked for the power company or the telephone company, and they knew how to put the big poles in the ground. Mm -hmm. So they used those, and uh, they, they uh, stretched the twin lead, lead in mm -hmm. from my transmitters to the antennas. And what, where was this, and what did you use it for? Oh, this was the uh, uh, what did they what did the general call it? Uh, wait a minute, I got it written down here someplace. Oh yeah, this was the administrative radio station. Uh huh. That's that was what my job was to put in the administrative radio station. And they used this uh, on Iwo, right? That's right. And uh, the three antennas. One was headed for the Pentagon directly. The other one, one of the others was San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And the third one was China. Uh -huh. We were fighting with the Chinese at that time. All right. And uh, then the communists came in and <laughs> we got out of there along with, <laughs> along with the Conchai. Wow. Conchai. How do you pronounce it? Saigon. Saigon? John Kaichek. Oh, there you go. Yes. And he now he created a new country. Mm -hmm. But so. you were able to, you were able to uh, communicate with Washington when everything was 
Oh, yeah, yeah. The signals were good. Yeah. Even though the sunspot cycles were getting to be pretty bad. Not too bad at that time, mm -hmm. but they, they were sinking rapidly. Wow. But uh, they work fine. What I find interesting is they called upon an amateur radio operator to do that. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting how I got that job. I don't know how much time you have, but uh, uh, I, since I was about nine years old, I fell in love with radio. Some friends of mine put earphones on me. They weren't as good as these earphones. <laughs> and I heard radio for the first time. And the Bell Laboratories, 10 miles from my home, they, they kept the transmitter going all the time. Mm -hmm. And they, they had some of the guests from my hometown, opera singers and so on there. To, so I, I used that, but then I began to build radios. Mm. I was not a ham yet. I didn't know anything about ham radio. Right. But I, I laid on my belly, just a kid, and I studied every little bit I could find about radio. And what year would that have been? Oh my, let's see now, let me get this straight. There's so many things happened. Uh, that would be about 19, about 1920, mm -hmm. when I got involved in uh -huh. building radios. Yeah. And I, was, I would be 19, nine years old oh. then. <laughs> so I built a lot of radios, all tuned RF. <laughs> I had a gain capacitor in each one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put a little regeneration in them, and I could I could listen to the West Coast with these radios. I built one for my dad, one for my uh, an uncle of mine, and one for an aunt, and anybody else wanted a radio, I'd build them for, <laughs> because nobody could build them and sell them commercially. Oh. All the patents. Oh. Uh huh. So the government finally got smart. And they, they called in people like Stromberg, Carlson, Western Electric, Westinghouse, all the people that owned some of the patents that were to use in, mm -hmm. in radio. And they created RCA, Radio Corporation of America. They became the holders of all the patents, all these guys. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to build a radio and go, and go into manufacturing them for sale, you would pay RCA a small royalty. Uh -huh. wow. that's, that's how it works. Then when did you get your amateur radio license? You know, I, hadn't, I didn't know a thing about amateur radio at that time. But uh, when, I, when I built my uh, little crystal set with the cat's whisker and all that, I had it on an oatmeal, oatmeal can. You know, these nice round, mm -hmm. I wound the coil on that and I had a slider across mm -hmm. it. And it worked pretty good, but uh, it was rather frail, you know, cardboard where the, yeah. you put a slider. <laughs> right. So I decided, look, I, I'm going to use one of these larger vegetable cans. And I wound the coil around that. And uh, not only did I still hear the broadcast band, but lower in frequency, I heard these guys talking, and they were the first radio hams that I ever heard. Mm -hmm. And one of the men talking was our, the guy that delivered mail. He worked for the post office. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that was very interesting. So I, I heard about ham radio, but I didn't have an interest for it yet because I was too busy. Too busy building radio. Building radios and <laughs> studying radio. I did it by studying. Yeah. I laid on my belly and I gathered all the information I could. And uh, that's how I learned. Wow. I guess I was sort of a college education there for there you radio. Are. How old were you when you got your amateur radio license? Oh, yes. Let's see. I got that in 19... Let's see. It would be 19... 29, I think it was, mm. 18 or 29. Wow. And I just got a certificate from the ARRL. I became uh, a member of the ARRL 
for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So they sent me a pin and... Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Oh, here's the, here's the thing that is interesting. I graduated from high school in 1929. Mm. And I, the first thing on my mind is I've got to get a job. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get a job, something to do with the radio or something. And I saw AT&T had an ad in the paper. They were looking for young people who had my experience. So I went over to West Street in New York City. They gave me a piece of wire, a battery, and a buzzer. The man said, make this buzzer work. It was very simple to yeah. do it. I got the job. Yeah, all right. So I became a repairman in New York City. And I did that for, oh, I guess nearly a year. But it was interesting. I, I consider this something of interest to me, mm -hmm. and learning, more sure. learning. And uh, I was in the Canal Exchange, and that was the first exchange that got the dial telephone installed. Oh, and they, it was being installed while I worked there. So after about a year, I got a call to go to the main office. I said, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> they sat me down there, three or four suits there. And uh, they sat me but, down. Uh, says, Marines were just, I'd call it murder. Yeah. As they came up over the beach, Japanese had all underground caves. They'd open up the door and just all. Oh. They killed the Marines by thousands. Oh. That was the worst thing. I better not talk about yeah, that. But, but they saved you, because you were in your Quonset hut. <laughs> yeah. Building radios, yeah. still building radios. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and you were the guy that was able to let the world know, it's over, we won, raise the flag, right? Yep, and uh, when the B-29s fame, the reason for Iwo Jima was the B-29s were flying all the way from Guam and Saipan to Tokyo. A round trip was nearly 3,000 miles. And it was tough on our equipment and our men. Mm -hmm. So when I landed, <laughs> it's a funny thing. I, I, uh, I went to the military office and said I want to join the military. And I was 31 years old then. Mm -hmm. And the captain came out, he looked at all my information and experience. He said, I can make you a major right now. And I said, hold on, major. I'm sort of promised to the Signal Corps Electronics Training Group. Mm -hmm. I figured that I had a baby and a wife and that was pretty good. I figured I wouldn't go overseas. Mm. I'd be training people and uh -huh. so on. But they they crossed me up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I went, made, I did a lot of, I went to Harvard for four months, mm -hmm. studied radio engineering. And the thing is, I knew most of it, but I still gained some valuable information from the course. I figured my life was a time of learning, and any chance I got, uh, I wanted to learn something more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I spent uh, the four months there, and then I got orders to go to MIT and study radar. My goodness. That was very, very secretive. I couldn't even tell my wife what I was doing. Mm. So I, I spent, uh, let's see, about two months there, mm -hmm. and got a nice certificate from them and one from Harvard. I went down to Robbins Field in Georgia and did some radio, radar work for them. And then all of a sudden, a sergeant came running out. I was going home on leave. And I had my wife and baby all packed up in my car. <clears throat> wife lived in East Orange, so I was going to drive her home. But a sergeant came out of the signal office and said, hold on, I was a lieutenant. That's the best I could get mm -hmm. with the tra this training course I was in, which is okay by me. Anyway, he says, we just heard from Washington. 
you're going to the West Coast. Mm. I didn't go home on leave. I, I made arrangements, got my wife, baby home. She had a mother and uh, four sisters living in East Orange, and I knew she would be all right. So I went west and uh, got up. I knew I was going overseas then. Mm. The military base where I was was right on the coast. And uh, there was a big long Quonset hut where I was going to live. Our ship was in dry dock. So I went in there and lo and behold, there were doctors, dentists, colonels, lieutenant colonels, all casuals waiting to go for seas. Mm -hmm. So we became great friends. Uh. And um, anyway, we decided we didn't have enough money. We sent it home. I'm making this too long, maybe, and I'll shorten it up. So we got a job as longshoremen. We had to join the union, <laughs> and it was legal for military people to get a civilian job if mm -hmm. they're waiting for a ship on dry dock or on leave. So um, finally, our ship arrived out of dry dock. And we set sail. It was secretive. We didn't know where we were going. But as soon as we got on the ship, we, we knew we were going west. <laughs> <laughs> no question about it. Well, I looked up one day, and I saw a big mass of land. And after studying the thing, I said, well, that's, that's Diamond Head. And that's Hawaii. So we're going to Hawaii. And we did. I reported in the signal office, and they said, take two weeks off, get to know the island of Oahu around here, and enjoy yourself. And in two weeks, we'll be in touch with you. Mm. When it, I enjoyed that. Uh, Hawaii was sort of a dirty, uh, you know, Honolulu was a dirty city. It was only one hotel, mm -hmm. and that was a Rotel Hawaiian, uh, the very fine hotel. Mm -hmm. And that was reserved for submarine crews when they came in. Anyway, after the two weeks were up, I got a call, for, went to the office. There was a general and some other officers there. The general sat me down. And he said, Lieutenant, I know why you got into the Army. And I don't want to change that unless you are willing. But he says, I have some important work that I know you can do. You'd made a study of me. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, if you're willing, I'd like to have you do this work for me. Mm -hmm. So I said, General, if you got a job for me, I'm for it. I didn't join the military to sit on my rear end. I, I, I need to be active, and if you have a job for me, I'm very willing to do it. Mm. So he sent me out to the radio station, mm -hmm. and uh, I spent about three or four months there, got to know everybody, all the equipment, and the general called me in again. He says, we've been worried about having having our radio station above ground, considering Pearl Harbor, and we don't know if the jets might come in again. Mm. So we dug a big tunnel in, the, in this mountain here, and uh, I want you to go out there and install all of our transmitters in that tunnel. So I did that, I ran the cables from the power station, and <laughs> hooked all of them up, got them all tuned up, and uh, got that job done. Mm. General called me in again. He showed me a map on the wall. He said, do you know what that is? I said, no, I don't, General. It looks like an island. He said, it is. That's Iwo Jima. He says, we're going to take the Japanese, take this island from the Japanese because 3,000 miles round trip for our B-29s from Maui and Taiwan, it's, it's hurting our men and our equipment. 
So we need to take this island, which is 700 miles south of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want you to build the radio station out there. He says, I, I know I know what your experience is. I made a study of you, and I long before you came here, I knew what your experience was in radio. And that's why you came out here to Hawaii. Mm. And he says, I want you to build this this radio station. Wonderful. And when the B-29s arrive on Iwo Jima, the, this will be our main radio contact with the Pentagon and, and San Francisco and also China. So I said, good general, I'm for it. He says, you've been out in the radio station, you know the men out there, pick your own crew, you can have 12 men all together, plus yourself. And you can pick the men you want to take and get all the equipment ready, all the wire and cable and transmitters and everything you need and get ready to take off. Mm. So I did that. And uh, again, we got on a ship and we were going west. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great story. Our ship was a very nice ship built by Norwegians, a very new ship. And it was an army ship. This Iwo Jima was an army operation uh -huh. because of the V-29s and sure. so on. So uh, we got out there and arrived just off the shore from Iwo Jima at night. And dust was all over the place. <laughs> machine guns going off, flamethrowers blasting, <laughs> and everything else that you can imagine. <clears throat> so I asked his captain, Captain, are we going in tomorrow morning? He says, yes, you are. <laughs> 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 it so happens that most of my men were awfully seasick all oh. the way out. Uh -huh. And I used to visit them on the deck, and they looked green in color. <laughs> they were really <laughs> Oh. But uh, they came to in a hurry. Yeah. And morning came, I was the first one down the rope ladder and got on the landing craft. And that was a little tough because the ship was going this way and the landing craft. I waited until they were level and I hopped down. I made out, I stumbled around a little <laughs> bit. And the men came down next and I. They stumbled around pretty good, but I, I grabbed them and kept them uh, from falling in the water. Yet, keep in mind, we had a big pack on our back and a rifle on our shoulder. Uh, and this landing craft was loaded not only with my crew, but a bunch of Marine soldiers were uh -huh. on there. So we got on and uh, we circled around for about an hour. I never got more tired in my life. <laughs> Finally, we landed right down at the base of Mount Mount uh, uh, Siribachi, mm -hmm. and that was a volcano, and, and it had sort of a mountain there, several feet, several hundred feet high. Anyway, so we, I had the men dig foxholes and found what looked like the safest place, right, right under the the. Um, volcanic mm -hmm. mountain, and uh, we dug our foxholes. Well, about three in the morning, I heard a patter of feet, and, and then a rifle went off. I jumped up out of my foxhole, and here my top sergeant had just shot a mm. He had a hand grenade in his pocket and one in his, his hand. I, I thought that was very unusual. We were told never to walk around at night. You'll get shot by your own people. <laughs> but I think the reason he was he was looking for water, I'm sure, mm. because uh, being in the caves, there's no source of fresh water on that island. Mm -hmm. uh, we we had uh, dist uh, stills 
we we still distilled the salt water, mm -hmm. and uh, we had we had pretty good water there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I found out where the where the radio station was meant to be. On the map, it was says theater. Uh, you know, theater. I, I guess the Japanese had a theater uh -huh. <laughs> where the where my or where the CBs had built my very nice Quonset hub mm -hmm. for my transmitters and so on. Mm -hmm. So I went to work and uh, I had the men first pick up all the ham grenades they could carry <laughs> and all the trip flares they could carry. So they went down to the munitions depot, depot and got that stuff and we distributed trip flares all around our place. So if any, any, any came in there, they would be, have quite a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had, I put the men on guard uh, at night, and they shot at a few, but they didn't come into our territory. Mm -hmm. Such an amazing story. Cliff Kehart, W4KKP, who uh, at the age of 109 passed away, um, just literally a, a few days ago. We'll have more on uh, the life and times of this American hero, but first, here's a word from ICOM. Ham for the holidays. ICOM's newest handheld amateur radio is the ID52A. Larger radio, larger color display, and louder audio. This VHF UHF digital transceiver is much more than a replacement for the ID51A. The color display is 2.3 inches for exceptional viewability and the audio is 80% louder. This multifunction dual band D-Star transceiver supports DR mode for easy access to local repeaters based on internal GPS information as well as terminal and access point modes. The ID52A also has Bluetooth for audio and data control. The IC705 is the perfect sidekick for hams who like to enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors have to offer. It's the perfect QRP companion, base station features and functionalities at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in just over two pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with the BP272, 10 watts with 13.8 volt DC external, single side band, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D star functions. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM radios. And you should also visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on uh, the radios you were. You can enter the ICOM weekly drawing for ICOM swag, such as T-shirts and hats. And don't forget to check out the details on ICOM's monthly grand prize drawing for November. It's the ID5100A dual band uh, digital and analog radio with D-Star, great radio, huge touch screen. I have one in my shack, and uh, it's just an amazing radio. Uh, you will certainly love this one, and you could be the uh, winner on ICOM's monthly grand prize drawing of that radio for November. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation for the official rules and to check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners. Sign up, and good luck, and thank you, ICOM, for your support of Ham Nation. Now, back to the life and times of a true American hero, uh, Cliff K. Hart, W4KKP. So I went to work and assembled all the transmitters. I had three nice, big, about two kilowatts apiece mm -hmm. transmitters. Do you remember what they were? That I don't remember the brand. Right. I, I, uh, I don't remember that. I was mm -hmm. too interested in yeah. unpacking them and right. putting them together. And, and then I put in all the cables. I had the CBs put trenches about about eight foot deep mm -hmm. throughout the cement floor. 
and then I ran the cables there. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing I did. We had a big rainstorm, and we were sort of next to a bank, and the water came down and right into our transmitter place. Oh. But I was saved by the trenches. The water filled the trenches. Ah. <laughs> Didn't hurt the transmitters. Oh, that's great. Anyway, after six months, I got everything working, transmitters all tuned up, the antennas on the towers. And these were these, were these rhombic antennas, mm -hmm. triangular. And they were already, uh, they were designed properly. Mm -hmm. The narrowest, narrowest was for the Pentagon because that's the furthest we had to go. Mm -hmm. So we needed a good directivity on sure. that one. The others weren't too direct, but anyway, they all worked fine. And uh, I, after six months, it was all done. And the, the, watching the B-29s come in and lining up that was a beautiful day to see mm. that happen. Wow. These great big planes and all ready and they, they take off 700 miles and back was no effort for yeah. them anymore. Uh -huh. And they'd go up every day and just bomb street after street to Tokyo, mm. burn it up. So that was very worthwhile, I decided. After uh, a while, the civilians, the president back in the States, decided that we should drop the atom bomb to, to stop the war. Mm -hmm. So they did. After the six month, my, I was ready to go on a marine plane back to, to Guam and from there go back to my headquarters in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But we, I was out at the uh, runway and we got an air raid warning. I said, that's very unusual. I hadn't, we hadn't had an air raid warning for two or three months, Japanese. And they, they, they didn't cause any damage. They were fast, those Japanese planes were much faster than ours. Mm -hmm. And they really, really were fast. But. They came over a few times, but they didn't do any damage. We had a good Air Force yet, and they didn't have much left. <clears throat> so I finally looked up, and uh, this plane didn't have any uh, IFF on it, information friend or foe. Mm -hmm. So after a while, we saw that it was a B-29 up about 35, 37,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And it was rather strange. He didn't stop at Iwo Jima. That's where we were their planes were supposed to mm -hmm. come. But he uh, kept right on going. And he was headed towards uh, Tokyo. And I figured that's strange. Well, anyway, I finally got on this small Marine plane. I think it was a, like a P-47 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I flew on and landed in uh, in uh, uh, Taiwan. I guess that's where it was, Guam. It was Guam. And I heard a lot of noise. I went to bed and a lot of noise after I landed there. So I got up to see what what everybody was shouting about. So I found out that uh, we had dropped this bomb. Uh, nowhere near Tokyo, about eight or nine hundred miles south of it, on uh, Hiroshima, and uh, mm. so they they just ruined that city and murdered thousands of people. And that plane you saw was or the Enola Gay. That was the one. Yep, that very, was the one. Very very. Everything good. happened sort of at once there. Yeah. Well, it, it, this is an incredible story. You've lived such a life, and we're all honored that you're still here. Because <laughs> it could have been a little disastrous. Well, that's but right. You've been, that's you've right. Been through but it all. I had, I had, I was very careful of my crew. <laughs> I did everything I could to keep them safe, because they had this heavy work of putting in the poles and running the 
two transmission leads. Wow. It was a parallel transmission mm -hmm. line, about 500 ohms thereabouts. Well, thank you for sharing all of this. This is really wonderful. Yeah, I told you the whole story. That's yeah, that's great. Thing that, what are you doing today in amateur radio? You're still on the air and having lots of fun, right? Oh, that's right. You see all the QSL cards. <laughs> now, that was when they first put up the antenna. He was one of the guys mm -hmm. that helped put up the antenna. Mm -hmm. And uh, right away, I worked all these here, and I got a whole, whole book full of more cards yeah. I didn't have any wool for. You have a... What it looked like a 706 is That's that? That's correct. And uh, one of the Tokyo Pi high power, so yeah. you you have a great signal here. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, I always got a great compliment on the sound quality. Uh, well, of course you work on that, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're so thrilled that you're still able to get on the air and make good contacts yeah. and WD4 KKP. Right. My goodness. Thanks so much for sh sharing all of this today and. We'll continue You're very on. welcome, and thank you. Calling CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. W4. Kilo, Kilo, Papa. In White Rock, South Carolina. Calling CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. W4. Kilo, Kilo, Papa. Calling An amazing story, story from an amazing man, and I was incredibly blessed to be able to spend time with him. Uh, during that time we were there, as plus I would call him <clears throat> every few months, and he was as strong as ever right up until the end. And I think he'd still be going, except COVID took him. And... Uh, there's nothing more that you can say that he he was just amazing and he 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 was very strong. Uh, when we first got there, I think I told you a minute ago, Hugh told me as we were going in the uh, the uh, his his room, he said, "I I don't know if he's going to tell you he doesn't like to talk about it." And uh, we got a couple of sentences out, and you saw what happened. He just took off. So uh, we're very, very happy to be able to share this with you. And uh, it, it, I didn't mean for this to be this much. I, 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 ha I had a handheld camera and these two little lav mics. I was just doing it for me. I didn't, you never know what the future is. I, I didn't have a tripod. And Hugh was the cameraman. And he had to hold, hand hold this the whole time. What a great job, you! Because <laughs> uh, yeah, there were a few times maybe you <laughs> switched hands or something, but we got it. And the main thing is the audio was good, and here we are. So that's that's really all I can say about it at this time. I appreciate uh, everybody watching and share the uh, the sentiments of this whole thing. It'll be on a replay. All I got to do is go to Ham Nation and look up the replay and it'll be on YouTube and all over. I, I would hope that a lot of people could share this in a club meeting. I've been doing two and three club meetings a, a week. I'm going to do one here in about uh, 45 minutes. I got to get out of here at 930 out to the West Coast. I love doing uh, ham clubs. You, you guys need programming. Gordo, myself, George, we're all happen, making it happen on Zoom or Skype. So just send me an email and away we go. Let's um, let's continue on here, Gordo. W what would be your comments about the entire thing and, and, and a man such as Cliff Kate Hart? Well, like so many ham radio operators that have special skills, Bob, uh, Cliff uh, is just 
uh, one of those that uh, helped save uh, probably thousands of lives by being able to uh, develop communications. And uh, when I was in the Army, they discovered I was a radio type. And even though I wasn't with a radio corps, I was very involved in uh, base uh, radio uh, systems. So it really points out being a ham radio operator, you mean another ham Maybe they're a general, and uh, they will open up doors for you. We're a fraternity, Bob, and that was great uh, for Cliff. Absolutely. He, he mentioned there once, I say it a lot in, uh, in all of my, uh, my goings on, that uh, ham radio was my college education. I barely made it through high school. I didn't care. <laughs> I had a career playing that crazy theater organ, and I was doing well financially. I didn't need anything else. But as it worked out, uh, two of my careers, the basis was amateur radio, as, as was with Cliff, and uh, he was he was an amazing man. Uh, Don, uh, I'm sure you have some uh, real comments with your father uh, uh, being in the war. Yeah, I I, uh, I I my dad never really spoke much about it, which a lot of those guys didn't. Now you know, I recently found my birth family. And my stepdad, we'll call him Papa Ron, he was uh, in the Marines in Vietnam. And he does talk about it a lot because he says, you got to get that out of your system. And that's something that I think a lot of the World War II veterans didn't do. It was, you know, you suck it up and, and be tough, but you have to get it out of your system. Um, and thankfully, Ron does that. My dad never did. And so I think of the stories he could tell over in the Pacific Theater. But um, two things I have uh, from his service is the flag behind me, which was on his coffin, his casket. And I have this letter that he saved. And I'm going to hold it up to the camera so you can see it. And I'll, I'll read it. And uh, this was hanging on my dad's wall forever. It says, to those of you who answered the call of your country and served in its armed forces to bring about the total defeat of the enemy, I extend the heartfelt thanks of a grateful nation. As one of the nation's finest, you undertook the most severe task one can be called upon to perform because you demonstrated the fortitude, resourcefulness, and calm judgment necessary to carry out that task. We now look to you for leadership and example in further exalting our country in peace. And it's signed uh, Harry S. Truman, President of the United States. Oh, wow. Um, okay. This is this a is treasure. treasure. Wow. Um, perhaps one day I will um, loan this to the National World War II Museum in, in uh, New Orleans. For sure, Bob, your video um, needs to be a part of the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. That is an amazing place that everyone should go visit. They cover the uh, Pacific and the, uh, and the European theaters. And it is an amazing place. So, um, Nick Tusa, you know, you know, Nick, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nick took me to that museum and we went down to do the, the, uh, uh, thing at, uh, the ham fest down there yeah. and I couldn't believe it. Everybody should go there. And I'm jewel. not much of a museum guy, jewel. but that yeah, was incredible. Yeah. And I agree with you. you know, things like this, that should be a, a focus point there. And yeah. uh, one thing that's interesting guys and gals, does anybody know who flew that Enola gay? It was, it was piloted by a guy by the name of Paul Tibbetts. Right. W4ZVZ. His, his ham radio call was K4ZVZ. He was a ham that flew <laughs> the Enola Gay. Now, does anybody know where the Enola Gay came from the name? That was Paul Tibbetts' mother, Enola Gay. A little bit more history. And yep. I, I, somebody sent that. I, was it Chip, Chip McCoy? I don't know. Chip sends me such great things. I think it was Chip. Yeah. Anyway, it was it was in the chat. Um, I think it was Chip, but they did mention yeah. it in the chat room. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, uh, I just, I can't tell you 
how, how neat it was. I, I met his daughter, Susie, and uh, she uh, she went out to uh, – there you saw us at the end in a, in a lunch. And uh, if you were uh, – <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but he would tell me it's okay. If you paid close attention, um, he's 106. Uh, he wasn't drinking uh, uh, Dr. Pepper like me. He's drinking a beer. Why wouldn't he? <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> and and my it. aunt that just passed away recently, she was 105. Uh, she said that's what kept her going was a Budweiser and <laughs> mowing the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. We laugh about these things, but gosh, it's these people are so entrenched in history, and amateur radio is a part of it. Uh, I just cannot impress upon anybody that's a ham what a special breed we are, and uh, I, I just – there's, there's there's many other stories. This is not just one of them. But at 109 years old, here's his latest QSL card that uh, – let's see, there we go. That came from Hugh the other day. That was his last QSL card. And, uh, man, White Rock, South Carolina. Thanks, everybody, for – for watching, and I hope you can pass on the replays to people that didn't uh, weren't able to make it tonight because this is pretty special. Thank Absolutely. you, Bob. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think Don might have a couple of other thoughts about something. We might have a, another word from a sponsor. So, Don, take it away for a minute. We do, as a matter of fact. Uh, this episode of Ham Nation brought to you by Hover. Now, have you ever struggled to find the domain that matches your business name? Well, now is your chance to upgrade to the perfect match. Millions of companies' names end with .inc. Well, now is your chance to upgrade to the perfect match. That domain name. You can have .inc domain name. .inc is a new premium domain extension for businesses that want to be taken seriously. Whether you're looking to upgrade your business to the perfect match or be proactive with brand protection, there's a .inc domain for you. So now is your chance to own your brand .inc. Have you ever checked to see if your brand name is currently available for purchase to the public? Don't let somebody else beat you to your brand's .inc domain. Avoid the competition and high prices of purchasing a domain in the aftermarket from small startups to a large enterprise. Brands are taking notice of the credibility of a .inc domain. Recently, Fluency Inc. upgraded their domain from fluencyinc.co to fluency.inc. Openly Inc. upgraded from openlyinsured.com to openly.inc. Very powerful tool here for your branding. Over 56% of Forbes' most valuable brands are registered, including PayPal, Facebook, Fox, Amazon, and Walmart. Hover has over 400 plus domain name extensions to choose from. They have powerful domain and email management tools that are intuitive and easy to use, whether you're a web pro or you're just getting started. No matter what you want to achieve, there's a domain name just for you. You get excellent technical support as well. They're available to answer any questions, and their support team does not upsell you. They only work hard to get you online. Twit is a uh, very, very happy uh, uh, user of, uh, of Hover. Great stuff. Very clean uh, user interface, very low cost. The customer service is absolutely second to none. Free Whois privacy protection, clean and easy to navigate UX, UI, monthly sales on popular top-level domains, too. Upgrade your domain to the perfect match. Grab .inc today with Hover. Go to hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the first year, the entire first year. That's hover.com slash twit. 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And Hover, we thank you for your support of Ham Nation. Let's get a look at the news of the week now from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline, report number 2224. These are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. The Colorado wildfires have been big news here in the United States. As firefighters struggled to contain one sprawling blaze, a critical radio repeater was destroyed by what authorities believe to be malicious vandalism. A portable radio repeater being used by firefighters at the massive Williams Fork fire in Colorado has been vandalized. 
The United States Forest Service is investigating after one of its temporary repeater sites was destroyed in early October, rendering the radios of firefighters useless as they struggled against the blaze, which is believed to have been started in August as a result of human activity. The firefighters were using the radios to communicate with their command post. The fire burned more than 14,000 acres, but no evacuation orders were given. According to news reports, firefighters found the repeater in pieces with the guy wires cut. The antenna had been snapped off. Replacement parts were found and repairs were made, but the Forest Service is continuing its probe. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. Bad news for hams in New Zealand who've been logging contacts on 5 megahertz. Amateur access to the 5 megahertz band was just a trial, and now that trial is coming to an end. Hams have gone off the air on the band as of midnight on Saturday, the 24th of October. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters informed the amateur community that the New Zealand Defence Force was unwilling to grant yet another renewal for amateurs to continue the trial operation. The Defence Force needs this part of the HF spectrum for tactical radio equipment, refurbished HF site equipment and its various new platforms. According to NZART, discussions will continue with the nation's regulator, the RSM, to explore other ways that amateurs may be given access to those frequencies. HAMS had been operating on 60 metres after access was renewed for three more months this past July. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, Sidel 2 bhf If you enjoy operating portable with the help of a solar panel or two, you might find this report particularly enlightening. Researchers are calling the work of scientists at the University of York a potential game-changer in the world of solar panels. By putting a checkerboard design on the panel's face, the researchers have upgraded its ability to absorb light by 125%. According to a report posted on the website goodnewsnetwork.org, the panel could possibly be developed to absorb far more solar energy than today's panels. Replacing the traditional flat panel surface with a checkerboard design is said to increase the diffraction rate and thus the likelihood that more light can be absorbed. The research team believes that this could also result in panels that are thinner, lighter and more flexible. The team's findings were published recently in the journal Optica. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Bucci for NJH. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Jack Parker, W8ISH, Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF, Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And we don't have anything from Dr. T tonight. She has been uh, extremely busy. Just got a private message from her on uh, Twitter saying she apologizes, but she's been very, very busy. But, of course, you can always check her out on Twitter at Tamitha Scove and, of course, spaceweatherwoman.com and, of course, uh, Tamitha Scove on YouTube as well, where you'll find a whole bunch of her videos. So for the latest, just uh, check her out on Twitter at Tamitha Scove. So happy to have her part of our team. And uh, another great lady of amateur radio is, of course, uh, our very own Amanda Alden, who has been watching the chat room. I'm sure you have uh, some interesting comments tonight from uh, our viewers. I really do. And I actually have some online comments, too, that I wanted to share from earlier this week. This one was really touching. And uh, this was directed right to you, Bob. Dan Cooch says, what a great man. It must have been like talking to a living piece of history. He had an impact on you that you shared with us. Thanks for sharing his legacy. Rest in peace, Cliff. Um, thanks, Dan, for sharing that. Some others, uh, gosh, it, I think everyone's kind of been overwhelmed over this whole story. Even I was. This man went to Harvard for four months and then MIT for radar training. How? First of all, can anyone answer me this question? Was radar just out then? Is that why it was top secret? No one could know about yeah. it? It was brand Gordo, new. Go ahead. Go ahead. And did you know that the Hawaiian radar was on 144 megahertz? Our two-meter band was one of the first bands used by European as well as USA radar installations. Two meters. Wow. Yep. Two meters. Wow. Here's I did something. Not know here's that. something else. Here's something else interesting about radar. The the fact that we have 
a microwave oven comes from radar uh, uh, radar technicians. There was a guy in Westinghouse, I believe it was, who had literally a Hershey bar in his lab coat. And he noticed when he walked in, and when he walked in front of the radar transmitter, it melted. And he said, "You know what? If we can put that downscale it and put it in a metal box, I bet we can heat food with it." And that's where your radar, that's where your, that's where your microwave oven came from. That's why the very first one from a manna was called the radar range. Yeah, I had one. Of those. I did yeah. the original. Absolutely. And it, it's uh, Don, it tells the same story all over and over and over. Right. What amateur radio guys, right. some of them were not trained right. in colleges. They were trained in labs like, yes, this. that's a lab. Darn right. And there's so much comes from day to day life from the brains and uh, soldering irons of just a simple little ham. So yeah. we are important. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I find the other interesting thing was that a general actually studied Cliff's background to make sure he was the right pick. He put enough time into there to look through his whole background and chose him, of all people, yeah. to take on a special mission, which is just amazing. Yeah. And a lot of people in the chat have said that, Bob. This is an amazing story. What an amazing man. Great interview. Thank you so much for bringing this to us, Bob. Um, and... Thank you for preserving a piece of history. Uh, what else did we see? Oh, the the one very cute thing was clearly I need more lawn and beer in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was the last picture. I should have held that a little longer. <laughs> but uh, he he was he was very humorous, and it, you wouldn't think that somebody like that. But yes, he was cool. And man, was he good on the air! Oh my, oh my! Yeah. He commanded the frequency. And then once in a while, guys would figure out who he was, and then it's like, oh wait a minute, I read about this guy, and uh, yeah. so we didn't. We didn't have to tell anybody. He was the man. And I was so, so happy and through the years. And, and you know, I'd call him every once in a while, and he'd, he'd be right there. And he knew exactly who it was and what we were doing and wanted to know. This was, in, this was important. The last, oh, since about 2018, I would say, hello, how you doing? He, knew, he recognized my voice. He would say to me, Bob, how is your wife? Because he knew she was going at that time through the cancer treatments, Aww. and he never forgot her, and he that really kind of stunned me in that he cared about little things, and there again, he was just a, an amazing person, and I'm glad that I could share this with you, and I think it was uh, worth the time, and I appreciate Leo and and Victor and all of them to give us the time to do this and uh, relinquish other things so we could we could show this to you and, oh and you know thank god I must thank god cliff was thank god cliff was was willing and able to talk about it because like my dad so many of those world war ii guys they kept it all inside but thank god he was willing to share this story yes, yes. well as i said going into the building hugh told me you know i had all this stuff and i, I didn't know i was just gonna maybe i didn't have an idea what i was gonna do i should have thought it better but you it really really jolted me when i found out he was gonna talk because hugh said he doesn't like to talk about this stuff and as you saw man he, he took off and hugh grabbed the camera and thank you so much, Hugh. Oh, man, Hugh Simmons, W4DRH. He he did a magnificent job. Think about it. He had to sit there for about a half hour, and he did great. But uh, it's all uh, it's all past, and we have to remember these great people that crossed our lives, and I'm really happy to share it with you. Thank you so much, Bob. Really amazing, amazing. video. amazing video. And um, I have to say the same thing about my grandfather. I didn't learn about what he did in World War II until I found um, an old photo album that he took uh, tons of pictures while he was in Germany. And um, he did some hard work. You know, he, he made it sound like he did nothing, but he was a tank commander. And he was the first one. His tank was the first one to push through Dachau. Is that how you say it? Um, concentration camp to free them. Mm -hmm. I just, Dachau. Grandpa... I uh, Dachau, thank you. I I just wish he would have talked about it, but I think it was way too hard. And he mostly, like many 
from World War II wanted to protect their families and their children from having to hear such hor- hor- horrid stories everywhere. Yeah. And some I of got the photos to tour. were distressing. Yeah. I got to tour the oh. National World War II Museum with uh, the father of a friend of mine, a, a radio colleague who was in uh, 101st Airborne, and he was there in the gliders on D-Day. And about 90% of those gl- those, the gliders were sitting ducks. I mean, they just, you know, they couldn't maneuver or, uh, you know, no engine, throttle up to get out of the way of, of enemy fire. But about 90% of those guys died on D-Day, those, the glider yeah. guys. And he survived. And got to visit the uh, the museum. My son uh, Tyler and I, when Tyler was very young, and we got to tour the the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans with him, and that was just a huge it makes honor. It special. And uh, oh yeah, and when we got over to, there were pieces of of one of the gliders there on display, oh. and he got very somber uh, mm-hmm. when we got to that that uh, section yeah. of it. But yeah, I will treasure that. Uh, for the rest of my life. And another thing that I have of my, of my father's, I, I slipped my mind until just now. I have what I believe is uh, the 45 that he carried oh. over there. Wow. It's, uh, it has a manufacture date of 1915, which would have been World War I. And it was manufactured for the military. You can look up the uh, serial numbers on the Colt website. Mm-hmm. And uh, that 1911 um, has been in my family as long as I've, I mean, it's, I've always known of it since hmm. a young kid, and wow. uh, it's I have it now, and I'm I, I can't confirm it because I can't ask him, but I'm almost positive yeah. that, to me anyway, I, I feel that yeah. was the gun that sure. he carried over there, and so it's it's a treasure. Okay, Don. Well, I think in closing we should make one more round. Gordo, do you have any last comments about any tonight? About tonight? Great heroes, and a week from tonight, we will salute them all for Veterans yes. Day. Bob? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, Don, you have one last thing you'd like to say before we rip out of here? Yeah, just to anybody who's watching this who has worn the uniform of the United States military, including the Coast Guard, um, Civil Air Patrol, anything, anything like that, just Thank you so much for your service. We're free um, because of what you do, and uh, we are all indebted to you. And uh, Cliff Kahart, uh, may uh, may God rest your amazing soul. Absolutely, Amanda. Well, you have a closing thought. I do. I um, Cliff used to join. I'm I'm dear to the to the traffic nets on forty and twenty meters, and uh, Cliff used to join them very very frequently, and it was really nice to see the North American Traffic and Awards Net do a last call for him on Friday evening, and I'm going to post that on the um, Ham Nation Facebook page just in case anyone wants to hear it. it basically, uh, spoke of his um, obituary. And things like that. And it was, I never got to work him. Evidently, you know, three or four nights a week, I never heard him, unfortunately. But he was very, very active in it. And um, he's going to be missed dearly. And his story, though, is going to live on. So thank you so much for that, Bob. And I, of course, I'm just going to briefly mention the Nets. Don't forget, the normal Nets are taking place right after this. So back to you, Bob. Well, thank you so very much. And I hope everybody's enjoyed this. Greetings to all. And uh, God bless. And I do hope he's resting in peace. So for all of us here at Ham Nation, for Victor for helping with the video, Leo Laporte to give us this great time each week here on the Twit Network. My name is Bob Heil, and I'm K9EID. And we do hope that you'll be back here next week. We select, we celebrate all veterans. Good night, 7-3, and uh, enjoy Amateur Radio. Be sure to check out the other shows on the network, like my other show, Hands On Wellness. I love to share different tips and tricks that's going to help you get a better grasp on your personal wellness. Just go to twit.tv slash how and subscribe now.